Well, welcome to another episode of DTV. We're very proud to have Joe Kavidar as a, as a professor of dermatology at Harvard Medical School. He's perhaps best known for his work advancing the adoption of virtual healthcare. He's an, been an author, editor, and advisor, including at Mass General Brigham and is chair of the American Telemedicine Association, co-chair of the AMA's Digital Medicine Payment Advisory Group, and serves on the AAMC's Telehealth Committee. He also holds the post as Editor-in-Chief of NPJ Digital Medicine, a nature research journal, and he has focused his 25 plus years of experience and insights into influencing the direction of healthcare at the national level. We're delighted to have him here on the program. I'm delighted to be with you, Avery. It's gonna be exciting to talk about telehealth in the future. Absolutely. I think it's fair to say you're a real um, telehealth evangelist. And you've really, you know, kind of advanced. It's really, it turned out to be critically important in the, in the period of the, of the pandemic. And now it's kind of considered mainstream. And, you know, it's kind of, people think that that's just the way, you know, things is kind of a done deal. What do you think is going to happen when the pandemic eases? Are people just going to flip back to their same old way of doing things? Will they continue to push forward? How is this going to change in the future? Well, there is that risk. I would say what we see now is is a hybrid environment or or to what I call like to call two channel healthcare delivery, where you have a digital channel and an in person channel. I, I don't think we'll ever see healthcare the way the uh, uh, the travel agent went, where you you see almost no brick and mortar travel agents anymore. Maybe more like banking, where we have both online banking and in person. But in any event, I think two channel is our future. At the height of the pandemic, 60 to 80 percent of care, ambulatory care, was being done by telehealth. We're already now in a place where about 20-ish percent is, which I think is the right amount. It's a lot was focused on a kind of replicating what current people currently were doing physically, but doing it in a virtual form. And yet, with technology and new devices. It seems like you could do some much more clever things. I'm really curious your thoughts about what the sorts of clever things could be done and where the biggest opportunities lie there. It, it is true that we uh, we brought the doctor's office into your living room. And for some people that feels like an enormous advancement. And, and of course it, it's a foundation on which we should build our future, but it is just the first step. I think one of the things I've done for most of my uh, telehealth career anyway, is look around me other industries are usually at least 10 years ahead of healthcare. So if you look at the experience you get with something mm -hmm. like Uber or Lyft or the, the uh, delivery of food to your door or even Amazon, I think that's the future we want to build for healthcare where you, first of all, you look at a digital channel as a first entree into the system reflexly. Right now, we certainly don't have that. And once you get into that system via digital, you're probably dealing with uh, a, a chat bot or some sort of technology uh, that has to sense when you need a, a person, mm -hmm. get you to a person, decide if you should be with a person uh, in, a, in a telehealth scenario, or you should get in your car and drive to of urgent care, or, or we should have an ambulance come pick you up and bring you to the emergency room. Because let's say the solution is go to urgent care, then we should be able to tell you uh, 10 places around you who has the lowest wait time uh, et cetera. The, the other things that I think will come in the, in the near future, which will help telehealth blossom, uh, our home uh, lab tests. That, that's a really interesting market that's about to burst. Uh, home devices, uh, things like the title care device, which you can look in your ear, look in your throat, measure your heart rate, measure your respiratory rate, and all in one device. And, and then one that I like a lot, digital biomarkers, which are these software widgets on your phone that pick up, usually it's vocal tone, um, based on the sound of your cough can diagnose your respiratory illness using software. So those are other uh, uh, types of technology that I think will help us build this digital first healthcare future. Did you see a big difference between how you can use telemedicine for acute care versus chronic diseases and, and real opportunities for breakthroughs? It seems like you were hinting at that. I do, and, and the, the issue is for, for acute care, the idea of a quote unquote visit is it makes sense. I'm sick, I need help, I find a, a Sherpa who can help me. Pretty straightforward uh, uh, economic equation. 
Uh, chronic illness management is not built for that. It's I have high blood pressure. It's got to be managed. It's going to I'm having it for the rest of my life. Uh, diabetes, type two diabetes, et cetera. And we need to build systems where uh, you're being managed continuously, not always by a person. I'm, I'm not suggesting that a person sits by their computer and watches your vital signs. But again, there'll be software involved that will triage when you get sick to a person who can intervene. But the notion that you check in every three months, that, that's purely a scheduling artifact. Uh, and when we get into a digital world, we don't need to do it that way. It should be more continuous. Well, I was thinking about the use of, um, you know, I've heard the use of uh, heart rate monitors to look at things like, you know, precursors for a heart attack or uh, a sensor that looks for an excursion in body temperature, indic in, you know, indicative of a potentially an, an infection. And those are the things that sprang to mind as, as could be really innovative uh, modes of care delivery. That's right. And, and even uh, uh, speaking earlier of, of vocal biomarkers, there is a company who, based on the tone of your voice, was able to predict people that were about to have an in incipient heart attack. So again, there wow. are these really interesting, and it, it, of course, I should mention this explicitly, they're, they're all driven by artificial intelligence algorithms that are, uh, that are trained to pick up these nuances in your voice that indicate these chronic illnesses. The same thing can be done with depression, um, but you're right. If I have a, a something like an Apple watch that's measuring my uh, heart rate, uh, et cetera, uh, that can be used to trigger uh, interaction with a healthcare provider when I don't even feel like I need one. Those sorts of things are uh, either happening now or on the cusp. Yeah, one of the other areas that, you know, you, you, speaking of the pandemic, you know, that's put a lot of stress on people's mental health. Um, you mentioned depression earlier and detecting that through voice. Um, you know, what are your thoughts about, you know, how telehealth can help in terms of the better diagnosis and treatment of, of mental, you know, mental health issues? Well, it's the number one indication or, or the number one use case, I guess, if you want to use a technology term for, for telehealth uh, is behavioral health. And the reason is, we start from this fundamental uh, question. I, I always ask healthcare providers, what do you need to make a diagnosis? What information to make a diagnosis or, or mm -hmm. a care plan? And of course, in behavioral health, it's what we're doing right now, talking to one another. Yeah. So it's perfectly suited for video. Some people argue better and it's for the following reasons. On the patient side, Again, depending on your behavioral illness, it may just completely upset your whole day to have to get out of the house, go somewhere, yeah. wait in a waiting room, et cetera. You, you, by the time you get in front of the person prescribing medicine for you, you're not yourself. Yeah. So that's bad. And when you're at home, you're more likely to be in a state that's more baseline. And for the provider to look into your home and see what's going on around you, can give some really appropriate, important clues rather as to how your milieu affects your mental health. So a lot of people think behavioral health is better. Uh, right now, 80 to 90% of behavioral health is being done by telehealth. I don't see that changing. Wow. So uh, I'm really curious, you know, you're, you obviously are, you're, you're a doctor yourself. And then how are you seeing it changing your interactions with patients? you know, in a positive or negative or just different way? It's different. I, I think uh, it's so I, ideally, not exclusively, but yeah. ideally, a lot of this is done with people you already know that you have a relationship with. Um, I, mean, I would say, again, that's ideal. And, and for problems that are, like in my case, it would be maybe an acne follow-up, a, a kid yeah. that I know who's doing well, everyone feels great then. It's, it's what I call the, the magical triad of, of quality, convenience, and access all rolled into one. Everyone's very happy. Uh, it's less, there, there's, again, it's not an absolute contraindication, but when you don't know the individual, what I find I, I have to do is I just have to lean in this, the same way if you were giving a talk over a uh, medium like Zoom, you, you emphasize your voice differently. You use your facial expressions because you don't have your body language. 
and you have to keep people uh, um, engaged. So with patients, there's a little more emotional input, a little more, lots more eye contact, things like that, just to make up for the fact that you're not in the same room. And it, it's what we call website manner. People are studying it and it's, it's, uh, it's a real thing. And when it's done well, patients are very happy with it. This has been this has been extraordinarily insightful. Are there any kind of parting comments you'd want to share about you know your views on telehealth or things should be you know people should be thinking about as they they look at the adoption and promotion of telehealth? If you've had a good experience and most patients have, uh, I would let them know that you care. I would also send that same kind of missive to your health plan if you're insured. Let them know you care. Yeah, um, because. There is this chance that people will just go back largely to the way we did it yeah. before because there's so much inertia. And, and I, I think that would be a, a tragedy. Uh, yeah. And we probably need some proactive folks to help with that. No, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. This has been very insightful. And uh, we also very much appreciate you leading a charge on this. It's, uh, it's, it's a critical, it's critical work that's gonna make a, is, is and will make a huge difference for a lot of people's lives. Well, thank you. I think so. And, and uh, that's part of what uh, gets me up every morning. So pleasure to be with you and, and uh, to be on your program. Well, thank you for joining us for the latest uh, DTV episode. If you enjoyed this content, I'd encourage you to subscribe to our DTV channel when you'll be, and that way you'll be alerted to the, when we put out the latest material. Thanks again and have a great day.